Since the 90s, the television industry has seen a rise in creator-driven animated shows. Many cartoon creators have become household names, and some have been lucky enough to make multiple shows. You have Seth MacFarlane and Butch Hartman that stick to what they know, creating shows that are very similar to each other and not growing beyond that. You also have Gindi Tartakovsky and Jorge Gutierrez that have branched out, creating movies and shows that differ from each other but still having a signature style. Craig McCracken falls into the latter and has created four different shows for three different networks. Pretty much everyone who watches cartoons has seen at least one of his shows, and there is no denying that the animation industry respects and admires him. But of his four shows, which ranks supreme? Today, we're going to break down each Craig McCracken show and see how they compare to each other. Hey guys, I'm Brad with Wicked Binge, and this is Craig McCracken Shows Worst to Best. Keep in mind, we think all the shows are great. None of them are terrible or unwatchable. But with every list, someone needs to be in last place. The so-called worst McCracken show goes to Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. This show is complicated. Well, the story isn't complicated, but the tone, its stories, and the reaction people have towards it are certainly complicated. Either way, Foster's was one of the big powerhouses on the network in the mid-2000s, with Cartoon Network clearly wanting it to be the next Powerpuff. However, it was evident early that it wasn't, and that it had its own story to tell. Looking at just the art, Foster's was very modern. A few of the characters had no outlines at all, and if they did, they were only there to outline certain details, like hair or patterns. Foster's also leans more on the round side instead of sharp angles, though every friend and character that was focused on had a distinct design and silhouette that seemed to match their personality. A lot of thought went into the designs and aesthetic, and everyone seems to agree that the art is great. In fact, it may be the only thing that fans unanimously agree on, because once you get into the characters, oh boy. It's not that all the characters are bad. In fact, a majority of them are likable and well-written, or at least funny or cute. But the ones that stand out as being problematic or frustrating are Cheese, Mr. Harriman, and the one and only Blue Regard Q Kazoo. Even though Blue is technically a five-year-old since Matt created him when he was only three, making his personality and behavior more understandable, Blue is obnoxious and annoying. He has some funny and likable moments, especially in early seasons, but in many circumstances, he's more a naive antagonist than a protagonist, and he drags the plot. He's not the heartless, cruel narcissist that people like to paint him as. He's just a selfish jerk, and we'd argue that Harriman, Cheese, and the sometimes controversial Madam Foster are much worse in terms of likability. Thankfully, most of the other characters are fine, with Frankie, Will, and Coco being just a few of the standouts. Looking at the show itself, Foster's starts off strong with House of Blues, a well-put-together pilot that tells the audience everything they need to know about this world. Seasons 1 and 2 also have iconic episodes with hilarious moments like Store Wars and Dinner is Swerved. For a while, it looked like Foster's would be just as enjoyable as Powerpuff Girls, if not more so. Unfortunately, things took a tumble fast. Season 3 reviews were more mixed. We started getting badly received episodes that fans hate to this day, either for their awful endings or for just torturing the characters for roughly 11 to 22 minutes. Episodes like Everybody Knows It's Bendy, Foster's Goes to Europe, and Imposter's Home for Make Em Up Pals. They also really ratcheted up Blue's jerkiness and selfishness, and other episodes were just dull. And strangely, Foster's could also get dark when it came to its world building, and how imaginary friends were treated like second-class citizens. After all, the main concept is that these living, imaginary creatures can be abandoned on the streets without too many people caring. In one episode, Harriman can't get a job because he's imaginary, and there's not one, but two episodes where one or multiple imaginary friends were basically sold into slavery. It's a really, really weird tonal thing that affects how you can view the show if you think about it for too long. Maybe if the series actually did something with these elements as a commentary thing instead of letting them subtly hang in the background, they would work better. But as it is now, it's weird. Thankfully, Foster's becomes fun again, with episodes like Room with a Feud, One False Movie, and The Christmas Special. Additionally, if there's anything that Foster's knew how to do well, it was their movies. Not including the pilot, there were two other movies, both of which are fantastic and enjoyable, making them the highlights of this uneven series. 
As for the rest of the episodes, depending on who you ask, the remaining Foster's adventures alternate from enjoyable and fun to frustrating and unremarkable. There are a few fan favorites in each season, but there are also a few duds. This has culminated in the series finale, Goodbye to Blue, which tries to act as a celebration but feels like a big waste of time that eventually leads up to a twist-ending gag. Foster's is far from flawless, but it's not terrible either. Even if a little over a third of the episodes can be skipped without missing much, there's enough for Foster's to be called a genuinely good show, if only because when it's good, it's pretty damn good. But with how uneven and inconsistent the series is as a whole, and for how negatively it can be received for certain characters and episodes, we had no choice but to rank it last. In third place is the original 1998 Powerpuff Girls. For a lot of Cartoon Network 90s kids, this show was their childhood. Considering all the reboot attempts, there's a reason why this show just won't stay dead. But what exactly made it so appealing in the first place? Let's start with the positives. First, the art design is iconic. You look at the three girls and you get their characters without needing to hear a line of dialogue. Blossom's hair acts as a cape while her bow acts as a crown, giving her a leader vibe. Bubbles' soft blue dress and round pigtails make her come off as girly and innocent, while Buttercup's dark hair with its sharp angles and that she seems to be smirking a bit instead of just smiling like the other two gives off a more tough attitude. The big heads and eyes make them cute without looking too fragile or baby-like. The round appendages, while weird at first, almost looks like they're always making the fist. All these details and style choices are a masterclass in character design, not to mention that any kid can draw these characters. Everything else like the other side characters and the sharp angled backgrounds are also very stylized. Another highlight is the rogues gallery. You can't have a superhero show without villains to fight, you know. And if you look at all the Powerpuff Girls villains, while they all may seem very different, they all have one thing in common. They're really silly, but they can still be a threat. Every villain has the capacity to kill, but they can also be hilarious. When you ask what people appreciate the most, is that you have these cute little girls fighting these serious bad guys and huge horrifying monsters. That contrast is both interesting and funny, and Powerpuff Girls walks that line between humor and tension. The villains are enough of a threat that you can have these action set pieces, but there's enough slapstick and fun that it's not too edgy. Beyond that, the villains are all memorable, and more importantly, likable. Mojo Jojo's repetitive speech patterns could have been annoying, but it gets funnier each time. Same with Fuzzy's over-the-top anger with people touching his property, or him's everything, really. Like, when you've got the literal devil and have episodes about him manipulating and traumatizing girls, but make him funny and ridiculous, you're doing something right. There's also Sedusa, Princess Motorbucks, the Amoeba Boys, Dick Hardly, and countless others. Everyone's got their favorite, but all of them serve their purpose. As for the heroes, each of the Powerpuff Girls feel like a real character, even if they may seem stereotypical. Each has flaws and has focused episodes where they're able to develop and grow. They work well together as a team. They share a strong bond not only with each other, but also Professor Utonium, who's honestly one of the best animated fathers. Miss Keen and Miss Bellum are also fun characters, while the mayor, yeah, he can be annoying, but in the early seasons at least, he can be funny. It helps that Tom Kenny brings a hilarious delivery with this character for the most part. Looking back on the first season, it is incredibly strong. It's no wonder this show became a hit as fast as it did. We get some really strong episodes early on, including Bubble Vicious and the Dynamo episodes. Season 2 and 3 also have memorable and hilarious episodes that have remained fan favorites. You've got the episode with the alien Broccoli, the super trippy episode with the Sandman, and Bubbles getting amnesia and thinking she's Mojo. We also start seeing some more of the pretty impressive half-hour episodes, like the one where everyone in Townsville switches body or the infamous Knock It Off episode. Unfortunately, as the show went on and many of the writers left, Following the theatrical movie, Powerpuff Girls not only lost a bit of its charm, but also its sense of humor. The show would come out with these really dull episodes with jokes or montages that would just be so stretched out they could barely get a smile out of most people, let alone a laugh. Granted, the series had these long, time-killer jokes throughout its run, but they were never this frequent or obnoxious in their early days. Along with the timing and pacing issues in the last two seasons, it lost a lot of the life it once had after the switch to digital animation. New villains were introduced that couldn't hold a candle to the older ones, ironically being more soft and cutesy and not very threatening. 
Animation and jokes both felt stiff, and everything was more… flat. The plots are dumber, like when the girls think a Sasquatch is their uncle. Come on, I know they're five years old, but given how many monsters they fought, I would think they'd be able to tell them apart from humans. There was a lot less action, in that there were a lot of episodes where the girls weren't allowed to fight for whatever reasons. There was one more burst of life from the original run, though, which came in the form of the 10th anniversary Powerpuff Girls Rule, a hyperactive and comedy-filled special with a memorable twist ending. This special isn't everyone's cup of tea, but it celebrates the Powerpuff Girls in a fun and enjoyable way. There's a lot to like about the original Powerpuff Girls. It's funny, it's action-packed, many of its characters are lovable and enjoyable, and there's even a couple of darker episodes that bring the drama and the tears. Unfortunately, with about a third of the series being a dud, that would have ended on a sour note, if not for the anniversary special. Watching this is almost like eating a meal that starts off really good, but by the end of it, you're sick of it and wishing you could go back to those first few great bites. For this reason, we have to give this show third place. In second place, it's the goofball sci-fi comedy from Disney, Wander Over Yonder. For being Craig McCracken's only show on the Disney Channel, there's a ton to like about Wander Over Yonder. Well, it may have gotten cancelled before its time. For the two seasons that it did get, it certainly made them count. At the time, it was seen as Craig's most elaborate show yet, and no better is this seen than in the art and animation. Craig went with a more Looney Tunes-esque design. Like with his previous shows, each character has a very distinct design and silhouette. The animation is also buttery smooth, flowing extremely well and making for some really fun sequences. But perhaps the most impressive part of the art are all the color schemes and backgrounds that it uses. The backgrounds are gorgeous, really giving the universe a true sense of magic with all the colors and sci-fi-esque planet designs. Just the fact that the crew had to design a new planet with new aliens from scratch for nearly every episode is insane. As for the four main characters, they're about as lovable as you can get. Unlike a lot of other happy-go-lucky characters, Wander stays charming and fun without becoming too annoying, though his helpful nature can be a bit frustrating at times. Jack McBriar's performance truly brings this character to life, while Wander himself has a ton of nuisance to him, being much more than just a friendly face, though still keeping that friendly, helpful core throughout the series. Pairing him up with his best pal Sylvia gives them both a fun dynamic. Of course, the true breakout character was none other than the hilariously evil Lord Hater. I want that Robo dog! Alongside his loyal commander Peepers. Similar to Mojo Jojo, Hater was pretty bombastic and ambitious, but could also be a sympathetic failure at times. He could be cool and intimidating one moment, and a total dork in the next. Hater also made for a great parallel to Wander, and it's through these two clashing that we got some of the best scenes and episodes of the series. We also got to see Hater go through a bit of an arc, with him slowly letting down his walls and becoming less of a bad guy, which was as enjoyable as it was interesting. Though we never got to see this arc's conclusion, seeing Hater save the galaxy in the final episode with all the other characters cheering him on was satisfying. Although the first season was simple, very much being an adventure of the week with silly and absurd scenarios. But hey, nothing wrong with simple, especially when it's as hilarious as these first few episodes. Both The Greatest and The Picnic were examples of how funny the show could be when it came to its timing, slapstick, and dialogue. At the same time, you had episodes like The Fugitives and The Good Deed that set up the show's core themes of being helpful and kind. It had a lot of heart, and quickly became well known for having plenty of sweet and heartwarming moments, along with being hilarious. It could be argued that the series became sillier and wackier throughout its run, which could be seen as a detriment depending on the episode or the type of fan. Occasionally, there'd even be an episode that wasn't too exciting or that had jokes that really didn't land. Even so, the series managed to remain charming and enjoyable throughout its first season, with the highlights no doubt being its half-hour episodes. No matter what Wanderer or Sylvia or Hater were getting into, there was always that sense of adventure and fun, and this was further emphasized through the show's music. In addition to being a sort of tribute to sci-fi and Looney Tunes, Wander Over Yonder was also Craig McCracken's first musical series. Although it never had a new song for every episode, like fellow Disney show Phineas and Ferb, there were still a few memorable tunes with series composer Andy Bean providing a ton of great lyrical and instrumental tracks. It even got to the point where the show was able to have an entire musical episode, which leads us nicely into season two. With serialized storytelling growing more and more popular, 
the Wander crew had the chance to tell their own serialized story, featuring the brand new villain, Lord Dominator. Okay, so remember how we said Hader was a breakout character? Well, that's if you exclude Lord Dominator, who quickly gained an army of fans with her fun yet diabolical nature combined with her punk rock beauty. And who could forget her solo number, I'm the Bad Guy? Yeah, she gained a lot of attention with that one, and for good reason. Still, we can't necessarily say that Season 2 was only great because of Dominator, as a lot of the show's already great qualities like its humor and fun stories were still there. The sense of experimentation that was started in Season 1 was able to continue on in Season 2. The show was also able to expand on its other core characters, not just Hater, but Wander too. We learned a bit about his past and why he needs to help people, and we got to see him at his lowest points. These instances again showed why Wander is such an interesting and lovable character, just for how kind, determined, and selfless he could be. But it was obvious that this was a first attempt at serialized storytelling. Though there's nothing wrong with the Dominator arc, it is disappointing that we don't see much of her for the first half of it. There's also a few fans that don't care for the plot point of Hater falling in love with her, with others feeling like there could have been more episodes dedicated to actually developing Dominator's character or her relationship with the rest of the cast. But despite these complaints, episodes like the Battle Royale and My Fair Haiti are still mostly considered season highlights, while the series finale is about as satisfying as you can get, all things considered. Maybe it's unfair to compare them since the latter's run was so short, but the point in Wander over Yonder's favor is that the show was able to stay consistently good, while Powerpuff Girls and Fosters had noticeable quality dips. Even if some preferred the more simple and not quite as wacky Season 1 over Season 2, or have critiques about the Dominator arc, you really can't deny that both seasons have plenty of great episodes and moments. The series is full of love and is able to make audiences laugh, smile, and maybe even think. Add in a great message about how it never hurts to help, and you've got a cartoon that's sure to be a cult classic. But while Wander was able to do a lot right, it's still only getting the silver medal. The best Craig McCracken show goes to Kid Cosmic. In many ways, Kid Cosmic is a culmination of all of Craig McCracken's previous shows, while still being able to stand on its own merit. Technically, this series still has one other season to go, but considering how amazing its first two seasons have been, we feel that we don't have to worry too much about changing our rankings later on. Inspired by superhero comic books, Kid Cosmic feels both classic and modern, grounded yet fantastical. As always, the art and animation is absolutely stunning, especially in Season 2, when the characters have to go to space. But even while on Earth, some of the sequences that the show provides are amazing. It does a great job with its action, even better than the Powerpuff Girls. There's this sense of speed and energy that keeps the excitement without making it too overwhelming. The characters, though maybe familiar, are also likable and lovable, with their bonds with each other being very clear. Although Kid's attitude can be frustrating, he never falls into the territory of being obnoxious like Blue, and is actually able to develop and grow, culminating in a really satisfying character arc in Season 1. Then in the second season, it's Joe's turn, and her story of learning how to become a leader is just as good. In both cases, their struggles feel real, making their eventual victories more satisfying. As for the other characters like Papa G, Rosa, Tuna Sandwich, and Stuck Chuck, though they may not always get as much development as Kid or Joe, they're still likable in their own right and bring a ton of comedy and heart to the team. Chuck and Phantos are excellent antagonists. They're both hilarious while also having the ability to be evil or intimidating. We saw this when Chuck mocked Kid for the death of his parents or when Phantos fought the local heroes on Herodias. It's the sign of a great villain when you can be laughing at them one moment and are completely impressed with them in the next. But hey, what did you expect from the guy who also created Mojo Jojo and Lord Hater? They stole my stone! Though not a laugh riot like some other McCracken shows, there's certainly more than enough humor to remind audiences that this is a cartoon and not some angsty superhero story even if the show's not afraid to get serious or dramatic in some moments. The music is also unique, actually having an upbeat classic rock heavy metal sound to it, which just further adds to the overall positive energy. But of course, what truly puts Kid Cosmic at the top is the story. Having taken what he learned about serialized storytelling from Wander, Craig has managed to create a really compelling story that never feels like it's slowly dragging or going too fast. We're able to see the local heroes grow and develop as both a team and as individuals, as they learn more about their powers, the world, and mysterious forces like the Biker in Black or Herodias. Plots build on one another, and it never feels like the show has to backtrack or reset. 
Additionally, the overall thesis is all about breaking down the typical traits of a superhero show or movie, and trying to narrow down the true qualities of a hero by using characters that wouldn't typically be featured in these types of stories, like a little girl or an old man. It's a unique, fun, and heartfelt take on the genre, with all the pieces of the story fitting extremely well. It's almost like an evolution of the Powerpuff Girls concept, just taken a bit more seriously, with the focus being more on the story and message than on the comedy. If there were any complaints, it could be argued that due to the shorter seasons, courtesy of Netflix, we don't get as many filler moments with the characters, leading to some characters like the diner customers or Chuck, after being redeemed, not getting much time in the spotlight. Although the story never necessarily feels rushed, some may miss having episodes that are more character-focused pieces or are even just silly one-offs that don't tie into the main story. Even this minor complaint doesn't take away from just how great Kid Cosmic truly is. It's got great characters, a great story, great action and animation, great music, and a ton of heart. It's the ultimate Craig McCracken show, and as far as we're concerned, it's the best Craig McCracken show. Alright guys, that's it! Let us know in the comment section if you agree with our ranking, and tell us what we should cover next. But remember to hit that notification bell and binge more of our videos. But most importantly, stay wicked.